This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts, as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. It's October and our second month on the farm here. There's plenty of jobs to be getting on with. And 400 years ago, perhaps the first priority would have been to get in the rest of the um, fruit harvest. And we've got a lot of pears to bring in still. The pigs, too, need to be popped down in amongst the trees. We've had a really good harvest of nuts, so they'll feed off that and fatten up nicely, ready for killing later on in the year. But our biggest project is the cow shed. We need to get a roof on and secure before winter strikes. It's a huge task. The first stage of building the roof is putting the rafters on. Stuart, Alex and Fons are getting to grips with it. In a week's time, professional thatchers will be arriving. That leaves seven days to get the roof structure finished. Roughly perpendicular to the actual... No, you'll need to... Um, a bit shallower, yeah? That'll come out here. All oh, right, need I need to, to be like that? Yeah. OK. Looking at where you are, you want to drop in to about there. That's it, it's biting now. Certainly is hard work, this sort of stuff. I've just got to look at that angle. Right, are we starting to drift towards the edge there? Right. You want to keep your pressure, because you're below it, you'll pull yeah. it down slightly, so you want to keep the pressure up. Keep right. So it's coming more this way. So I'm just... Yeah. So I'm trying not to actually push it now, I'm trying to just let it... Just... Yeah, ideal. Brilliant. We've got two for each rafter. So, 64 holes, is it? Yeah. At least. And how far are we through this one, Pons? About half an inch. Half an inch. Maybe halfway. Much of it's technique. A lot of the things we've been doing, you know, just in the, the two months we've been here, I've found that you go in, sort of guns blazing, and then... Uh, about halfway through the day, when you're beginning to flag and ache, you realise that it's a lot more about technique and having them kind of just pacing yourself as much as anything. One of the regular morning tasks, letting out the chickens, falls to Chloe. We've got four chickens and a cockerel. The cockerel looks after the chickens, basically. He sort of herds them up, herds them around and... Um, generally makes a lot of noise when something disturbs him or one of his hens. At this time of year, we're getting one or two eggs a day maximum, I'd say. Um, normally, with four chickens, you're expecting at least one each a day in peak laying time. But it's coming to the time of year where they're molting and therefore they're not producing as readily. After the glorious days of September, October brings rain to the valley. The water is sorely needed for their newly sown crops, but it's not good news for the team working to a deadline on the cowshed roof. Might have to call it a day shortly because it is really beginning to bucket down. So I think, Stuart, should we um, run for cover? I think we'll run for cover and maybe come back and do this at another time. At the back of the farm in the well house, Ruth is busy making breakfast. On a farm 400 years ago, breakfast was usually served after putting in a few hours hard graft. I've made a bit of porridge for breakfast this morning. I had to boil the water anyway, um, so I had to light the fire for scalding out all the dairy things. I've got some blackberries as well I'm going to drop in just to make it a bit more interesting this morning. Outside, the rain has made work difficult, partly because of the inadequacies of their 17th century style clothing. These coats are 100% wool, so at the moment, as we've come in fairly promptly, it's just sitting on the surface. But if that gets completely saturated, it'll weigh about an extra 10, 15 pounds, and it'll take the best part of a couple of weeks in this time of year, even putting it in front of the fire, to actually dry out. So it's a case of 
coming in whenever the weather turns really nasty and getting on with those indoor jobs that we've saved for this sort of purpose. As the team adapt to an outdoor life of manual labor, they need an appropriate diet of good, rich food to keep them going. The rich people. Back in the age of Shakespeare, farm workers ate far more than we imagine. With such a high volume of hard physical work to do, they actually consumed as many calories as a modern athlete, up to 4,000 a day. Butter and golden syrup, or butter. One place where they'll be burning off some of those calories is the garden. October was the time to gather in some of the last fresh salad greens before having to spend the winter months on dried preserved foods. The rocket here, that's done quite well. We're still getting nice fresh leaf off it, even this late in the season. Um, and I think it might carry on for another week or two if I just pinch out all these flower heads so that it puts its energy into the leaf rather than into seed. People think of it often as a, a really sort of modern, posy, fancy imported ingredient, but it's not. It's a traditional British um, garden salad. It just went out of fashion in the Victorian period for some reason. But other than that, right through history, rocket. Securing the roof timbers on the cow shed requires dozens of roof pegs. Metal was too expensive and might even corrode the rafters. So Alex is having a go at carving them from wood. Now, this is the kind of 17th century equivalent of the Black & Decker work, mate. OK, we've got the vice. It's operated by my, my feet here. So I slide it under, like so. And as I push my feet away from me, it grips the peg, you see? Now, I need something called a draw knife. Quite simply, all I'm going to do is just take the corners off, shave down the exact width of the, uh, the pegs we're going to need. OK, I think that's just about done. So we're going to need something in the region of about 70 pegs, maybe 75 pegs. With pegs made, Alex, Stewart and Fons can crack on with securing the first of the cowshed's 32 rafters. What advantage you got with these over modern drill bits is they don't jam. <laughs> Give it some weight on the top now, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> That's gone. I can feel it. Their speed will have to rapidly improve if they are to be ready for the thatchers. But Alex's pegs are doing the job, and the rafters are beginning to take shape. Well through. Oh, that's, that's nice. holding. That's great. Right, get the matching one on the other side. OK. And then we've got this pair locked. It's a bright new morning in the valley. Time for Ruth and Chloe along with Stuart's son, Alistair, to get out to the orchards. October is a key month to harvest nature's bounty, and there's a good crop of pears to bring in. Good lad. Take your time, don't hurry yourself, all right? This is a black Worcester, which is a warden or cooking pear. Not really worth eating raw, um, quite hard. But as soon as you cook them, it brings all the sugars out. They soften and they sweeten up. They're a good keeping pair, and therefore it's worth making sure that you, you don't bruise them. You don't let them lie on the ground and get wet. You choose a nice dry day, like today. <sighs> Oops. Oh, Queen Elizabeth really loved pies made out of wardens. Um, and they turn up in New Year's gifts to her quite often in quite large quantities. It took four days to secure all the rafters on the cowshed. But before thatching can begin, the whole of the roof still needs to be rodded, and that's another couple of days' work. These rods are going to be woven in amongst the rafters to produce a mat across the roof that we can then lay the bracken and the thatch over the top of that. It takes a real team effort to cut, sort and then secure the rods. It has to be green when you use it, otherwise you'd never be able to bend it like this. But it'll then season in place. If we try to do this with old rods, they just snap on us. Even now, you have to be careful not to take them past the point of no return at which they break. The seasons dictate what has to be done when, and 
the systems have developed as to what you do in which month to cope with that. It's not a case that each person comes in and devises his own system. You know how the system works over the generation. But even then, the weather's the joker in the pack. The weather breaks on us, then uh, we might find it's very dangerous working up there. And we've got to have this roof on, otherwise there's no shelter for the cattle this winter. I'm actually using a, a shepherd's crook. Uh, it's, not, it's not really designed for this. It's doing the job okay, it's got a, just an iron hook on the end. It looks really easy, but the branches are actually quite springy and very hard. They're fighting back. <laughs> That is it. That's bridged that gap there. I've done a bit of buildings recording as an archaeologist. For me, really, it's just nice to, to, to put that theory to actually building, a period style building. I mean, one of the things generally I'm, I'm really picking up on is the wood, different types of wood, what they're used for. We're finding that the hazel is absolutely ideal, um, especially the really green hazel. They just seem to slip in so easily. With the rods being woven into place, at last, the roof is looking strong enough. It's going to be covered by well over a ton of thatch. Working on a timber roof could present plenty of potential hazards, but it's the period footwear that's causing Alex and Fons the most concern. Yeah, these are uh, authentic sort of leather shoes. They had a flat sole, but as, as I'm wearing them, that's given it a bit of grip. Whereas mine are hobnailed. Um, which is actually really useful for um, when you're walking across the grass. As soon as you get on the cobbled stones, you tend to start slipping around all over the place. And uh, actually, on the wood, it can be quite slippy. But you were yes. wearing some the other day, and yeah. when it's wet on the hobs on the wood, they, they just slide around like yeah. ice skates, basically. Yeah. I've broken them in now, so they're more comfortable. I was getting awful blisters to start with. And the, <laughs> and the weird thing is, is when we got the boots, I didn't realise this. There were no kind of left and right boots. You just had, your shoemaker would make you just a pair of identical boots. So when they arrived, I was very much under the impression that I'd been given um, two, <laughs> two, two left feet. This one's kind of settled in, but this one almost looks like it should be on that foot. And they look really stupid when I first started off. I don't know which ones I put on which feet on which days, so <laughs> yeah, two left feet, basically. I think it changes according to uh, my blisters. <laughs> OK, anyway, let's get on, let's get on. Another October morning, and the next phase of the cowshed roof sees the team out in Triangle Field. They're cutting down the bracken they need for the base coat of thatch. We need masses of this. Um, the roof itself is about 500 square feet. Um, and to cover that, we need approximately enough bracken to fill the cow shed to put on the roof, just, just for an undercoat for the thatch. We had a bit of rain last night, but I don't think it'll do it any harm. The, the circulation, the air circulation in the shed is going to probably dry it out anyway. We're trying to kill two birds with one stone um, here, and this, this is triangle filled. Um, and we've already taken some rafters out of here. What we're doing here is we're clearing because we'd like to use the field for a pasture or um, for arable. Um, we haven't decided yet. To thatch the roof, professional thatcher Keith Paynes has come to help out. His first task is getting all the edges in order. I'm actually setting an eave on the building. It's the first stage of re-thatching. We make up with the wheat, small bottles. It's, it's just the standing wheat that we use for rethatching the whole building, but these are actually tied into small armfuls. A bind is uh, put around them like so. Just a handful of straw twisted round as a straw bond can get incredibly tight with that, so you can actually throw them around. And then we're actually lashing these to the timber work. We're using hemp twine and this will be individually tied around all the, all the sticks and rods that are poked through to create a firm eave with a bit of density that creates the depth of thatch. You won't get wind damage to it and it'll be very difficult for birds to pull out. With so much bracken together, it's time to get Blackthorn, the valley's resident farm horse, pulling her weight. 
Blackthorn's doing really well today. She's a lot quieter than she was last time we worked her. Um, I think I've cracked this one, so I take her out and make her do a, a little bit of work before we start. So she's just taking the fizz off her. We've had a couple of problems with the collar, but I think they're fairly much ironed out now. One of them being that the leather strap is too big for the buckle. It seems to be doing the job quite well. She's managing to pull quite heavy weights with it. Ready? Yeah. Having spent hours cutting the bracken in triangle field, all they have to do now is persuade Blackthorn to drag it up to the cow shed. Good girl. Come on, sweetie. No, 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 no. Come on, you can do this. Come on. Walk on. Come on. No, no, don't be silly. Walk on. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Come on, then. Good man. What a good girl. Steady, steady, steady. What I'm doing here is um, trying to get an even density of depth on the thatch because what I don't want it to do actually is gully out. And what we mean by gullying out, if you have a, a thinner part of thatch and then a denser part, you'll find that the thinner part will actually wear quicker. This overhang is quite important to actually shed the water away from the stonework of the building. The more even you get this, the better water flow you're going to get away. On, on. Blackthorn finally makes it up the hill. But the big question now is, how many more trips will she need to make? How's that, Keith? How many more loads, then, will we need? Like that. Another four to finish this, seven, eight, about another ten. You really know how to cheer somebody up, don't you? This horse now hates you. <laughs> she doesn't. Yep. OK. No, she's done so well, and she's a different horse from, from what she was when we started. She's so much fitter. Um, she's, lost, she's lost a bit of weight. She's getting fit. She's got shoes on. She's, she's turning into a proper working horse now. She's earning her keep. So I'm, I'm really pleased with her. A fresh dawn in the valley. And with the pressure of completing the cow shed now passed on to the thatchers, our team can get on with their next seasonal priority, getting the pigs out into the woods. This time of year, all the acorns are falling, the beech mast, hawthorn berries are coming down, and it's time to make the most of that by taking the pigs out into the woodland so that they can fatten up, because in a few weeks' time, we're going to slaughter them. Come on! Pigs are great on acorns. The only problem is, if they get too many of them, it can actually cause them to explode internally. So uh, this is the swine herd's job, making sure they get just the right mix. Hey! You naughty pig! Pig in the undergrowth! We've lost a pig! Helping Keith with the cowshed roof is John Letts, an archaeologist who's been studying ancient thatching for decades. This bracken is going to be the permanent base coat that goes onto the thatched roof. Thatch is really made of these two layers, a permanent base coat that's never replaced, so it's always sheltered from the elements, and then a weathering coat of another material over the top. And bracken is a, a very unusual material to use. Um, it's certainly not been used for a century, century and a half at least. You can look at it archaeologically, you can, you can read about it, but actually doing it is something slightly different. It's full of thorns, full of spores, I'll be coughing all night, um, and that's certainly not recorded. Keith? Keith? Keith, you want me up there? Yeah, I'll just secure this, John, then you can come on up. How's that? Outside edge, cover that side. After the first minor breakout, the pig drive appears to be going smoothly. Pigs are not the easiest of animals to drive because they're a woodland creature. And the result is that when you frighten a pig, its instinct is to run for cover. Keep those pigs under control. <laughs> You've got to have just the right amount of uh, discipline with a pig. Too much and it gets frightened and that's it. You'll never see it again. And too little and it won't move because it's got something interesting it wants to get its snout into. Go on, pigs. Gently, gently through that gateway, otherwise they'll spook yeah. sideways. Oh, he's found some crab apples off that tree in the hedgerow. The pig's designed to hunt for food with its nose. It's got very poor eyesight, very good sense of smell. Just now I heard them crunching. 
We've got a hazel tree there, so almost certainly that was hazelnuts. The next tree on the other side of them, it's a small oak. There'll be acorns under that and they'll be scoffing those as well. The undergrowth is full of tasty titbits for pigs. But there's something else that they like, the taste of freedom. The pigs are just hunting around for anything that looks tasty. And once they think the little patch they're working on is finished, they're off. Flapping skirts works remarkably well. They don't really like skirts flapping in their faces. And the occasional pat on the back with your hand or lightly with a stick sometimes moves them, but only if they really want to. Ouch. It's uncertain how well the bracken is going to work as the thatch undercoat. It's an experiment even for our two expert thatchers. Now, this is the first time I've actually worked on a bracken base coat. It's, it's certainly different. With one or two concerns about this being a little bit green and the shrinkage. I think the chances are it would have been dried out before it was put on. But that's part of the experiment here. I mean, we, you know, how long is it going to take for this green bracken to actually dry? How much it is going to shrink? Because if we then put a surface coat of weathering straw over it and the base coat that it's fixed into shrinks, it'll let go of these fixings that are holding that surface on and the surface should slip off. And we don't mm. want to get into that situation. This one's called Arthur. He's the king of the pack. And, uh, and this is his missus, Guinevere. Clever pig here, he's a bit of a troublemaker. The reason why he's only got half a tail is because he tends to wind all the other pigs up. One of them's obviously snapped, spun round and bit it off. They're a wonderful beast. I mean, not only are they really useful for, for clearing scrubland, um, they taste fantastic, uh, and they pretty much look after themselves. Very much the good natural life for a pig, and they're going to make excellent bacon at the end. If they get at more of those crab apples, you won't even need apple sauce on them. Well, I'm looking forward to a nice pork dish. Sad to see him go, though. We should maybe think about getting these fellas up into the, uh, the styes. Alex, was that you? No, it's the, one of them has got problems. <laughs> While John compacts the bracken, Keith has to tie every bundle onto the roof using a thatcher's two-foot-long needle. And this is the fun bit. I've got to stuff my arm through the, the base layer. I've got the rafter now with my left hand, and I just find my hand with the end of the needle. I've removed the flax now, pull the needle back out, and then dislocate back through th this side of the rafter. Back up again, into the needle eye, back through, and there should be the end of the string. There it is. And then I will actually do a, a tie with a horizontal piece of hazel. I force that into the base coat I've already created here. Goes in a fair way, and then I'll actually just do a single knot this end, and as I tug this, it will pull that tight. You can see where that's pulling that in now. To even it up, you need to get a bit of weight on here. And you just literally give it a bash. And you see how it's compacting the bracken really tightly, creating a nice firm base. With everyone putting in so much effort outdoors, Stuart is planning a good hearty dinner. I have here a shoulder of lamb from one of the old ewes on the site. She's past wool production. So she's been fattened up in the autumn and now we've killed her. She's going to be spit roasted and at the period the ploughman, that's the farmer and his senior labourers on the farms, would have expected roast meat twice a week, usually Thursdays and Sundays. There she goes, settling down onto the spikes. And these spikes will stop the meat sliding round when you're spit roasting it. Otherwise, you'd finish up with the joint heavy side down the whole time, burnt on one side, raw on the other. I'll just put a bit of salt on that. In the 1600s, the British already had a reputation for serving up the best roast dinners. A period source states, they are more polite in eating than the French, devouring less bread, but more meat, which they roast in perfection. If I go up, do you want to pass them up to yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, that's mm. fine. With so much fruit ripening on the farm in autumn, it can't all be consumed at once. 
Without refrigeration, the best way of preserving it was to store it up in the loft. Yeah, no problem. 400 years ago, this is the sort of place that you'd store your fruit through the winter. It's cool up here. We're nowhere near any of the fires or chimneys. It's dry, and there's a really good circulation of air. With luck, we should still be eating, have some fresh fruit to eat right through until sort of March time. And of course, you've got to come up at regular intervals and pick over. So that if you get any bad ones in amongst it, you get rid of them before they can spread that bad to all those that are around them. Four hundred years ago, all the farms, even the labourers' cottages, would have had large, productive vegetable gardens. And one of the items that we'd have in season is beetroot, which I'm going to boil up to add to the salad. Up in the apple How's loft, it it's not simply Getting a case of storing and checking your fruit. It needs a carefully worked system. We keep all the different varieties separate because they've all got different uses and they've all got different keeping times. So we've got the Cornish aromatics that Chloe's picking through at the moment. You say there's quite a lot of rotten ones? Yeah, there's quite a few down here. Those are my favourite, for example, the leather coats over there for eating just straight. I think they're gorgeous, they're really, really russety. And, and my favourite for cooking are the costard apple here, which makes lovely pies, really nice. But we've got lots of different varieties. We've got Pippins, London Pippins. We've got the um, old pear mains here. You all right, love? Yeah. <laughs> it's hell on the knees. The joints should be ready now, so it's now a lot hotter than when we put it on. Slide off the grip on this end. She spent eight years running around this hillside and she's quite a tough old beast. We're going to be chewing a lot tonight. And there she goes. Last few. I'll come and give you a hand, Chloe. It's been a good month in the valley. The pear harvest and pig drive have gone well, but our team have fallen behind with the cow shed. The roof needs to be finished before the cows can be brought in, when the cold really begins to bite. And the strings just sort of... Well, it has really... It's started to get cold the last few months. So finished the big room. Next time in the valley, it's November. The team need to get a move on finishing that cow shed. It's time to slaughter a pig. And then prepare it for supper.